What's up guys and welcome back to another video on SAT Math from the Scalar Learning Channel. If you're wondering who I am, my name is Josefa Kapadia and I am an SAT Math expert. I'm also the founder of Scalar Learning. This video is part three on how to get a perfect 800 on the SAT Math. And if you haven't seen the first two parts, you should definitely check them out as they will explain my methodology and how I created these strategies. And this is the final installment of final 14 strategies on how to get a perfect 800 on the SAT math. And these topics in this video constitute about 17% of what's covered on the SAT. So the last 17% of topics. First, we have interpreting nonlinear expressions, which constitutes 1.55% of the test. And here, the strategy is understand vertex, y-intercept, and x-intercept of quadratics. So it's just a, it, it's a good idea to wrap your mind around what all of these three key elements mean to a quadratic or a real life situation that a quadratic function is modeling. For example, my vertex is usually going to be either my low point or my high point, right? If we, depending on the nature of the graph, and in this case, because that A term is negative, the vertex is going to be a max point, a maximum height, okay? The x-intercepts are going to be, since this is modeling a trajectory, we want to think about the x-axis as like the ground, so the x-intercepts are going to be when it's going to hit that ground. And then last but not least, that y-intercept is, is going to be a lot of times that actual real starting position, because usually the y-intercept means time zero. This is where it starts, okay? Uh, and we can find all these values pretty nicely. Nicely. For example, we can find the vertex by using our nice formula of x equals negative b over 2a, if we need that, right? Uh, and and, that, and then we plug that in, we can get the y value of the vertex. We can get our x-intercepts by factoring and finding when the whole equation goes to zero. But in this case, the one that I want to focus on, which is relevant here, is how to get our y-intercept. And when it's in this nice standard form, the beauty is that the y-intercept is pretty easy to spot because the y-intercept occurs when x equals zero. So when we plug in a zero, uh, in this case it's t, but that is our x normally, those two zero out and go away, which means that our y-intercept is right there for us in standard form, which is 72. Okay, now let's take a look at this problem. It says the function above again models the height uh, in, in, of an object off the ground t seconds after being launched into the air. What does the number 72 represent in the function? Now, if we know that that's our y-intercept, right, straight away, we know that, you know, that constants our y-intercept, so therefore that must be our starting point. Y-intercept is always our initial value or starting point. So we can go straight to the initial height in feet of the object. Maximum height, again, that would be a vertex value the initial speed now that would that would make sense if this was a speed function but it's a it's a height function so that doesn't make sense and then uh, again, maximum that is out as well because that would refer to a vertex. Now we come to the next topic, which is operations with rational expressions, which also constitutes 1.55% of the test. And in this case, the strategy is no polynomial long division. Okay. So these problems are pretty interesting because again, it's one of these, Hey, which of the following expression is equivalent to this? There are actually multiple ways to solve this problem, but if you remember, now, when you see something like this, which is really the top uh, polynomial divided by the bottom one, you can say, well, this is a polynomial long division problem. Again, there are other ways to figure out if these are equivalent. But if, you, if your mind goes to that place and you say, wait, wait a minute, I can just divide and, and see what the remainder is and all that and I'll get my answer, it's become so much easier. So I'm gonna show you how to divide this, for example, if you, if you need a refresh. So I'll throw in the x squared minus 2x minus 5 like this and just like our normal division symbol, and then we got x minus three on the outside. Then we say, we just look at this first term. How, what do I need to multiply this x by to get that x squared? That's all we care about. I'm gonna multiply it by x, right? And then I get x squared minus three x, because it kind of distributes to both of them. Then we subtract by negating both of these guys. These cancel out. Negative two x plus three x is x. Bring down the negative five. And again, multiply this to get the x's to line up. That's all we care about. So that would just be a positive one, right? Now I get that to be x minus three. Negate, negate, cancel out. Negative five plus three is negative two, and that's our remainder. So our final answer is that x plus one, and then it's minus, because it's a negative, two over whatever is the divisor. That's what we always throw our remainder 
on top of the divisor? And the answer is D. Next, we come to data collection and conclusions, which constitute 1.55% of the test. And here, the strategy is that the sampling must be random. So they love to ask about uh, possible sampling procedures. And then you gotta be really insightful and think, wait a minute, was there a bias in the way that the sample was collected? So let's look at this one. It says, to determine the mean number of children per household in a community, Tabitha surveyed 20 families at a playground. So let's stop right there because they don't say it's a random survey. They're already giving some premise to where the sampling occurred and it occurred at a playground, which is kind of interesting. For the 20 families surveyed, the mean number of children per household was 2.4, which of the following statements must be true. The mean number of children per household in the community is 2.4. That's so definitive. And, I, and I'm not liking it right off the bat. And that's too big of a conclusion to draw at this point. We could say maybe, maybe even at best, maybe. Uh, but we haven't even addressed the issue of how the sample was taken. Next, a determination about the mean number of children per household in the community should not be made because the sample size is too small. Usually the size of the sample is never the answer on the SAT, at least I haven't seen it yet. Uh, because, I mean, we can have various samples and you just have to take that with a grain of salt and you, you take what you can get. But that's, that's not gonna be valid. The sampling method is flawed and may produce a biased estimate of children per household in the community. I'm going to agree with this. Now, here's the key reason why. Think about it logically. If you're, sample, if you're taking your sample at a playground, you're already biasing towards families, people that have kids, right? It, it, nobody's going to go to a playground if they don't have kids. So that's the problem. That's the inherent issue with this type of sampling method, which is why it's flawed. It's going to lead to a biased result. Last, the sampling method is not flawed and is likely to produce an unbiased estimate of the mean number of children per household in the community. And of course, that's, that's got to be wrong if C is right. Next, we have volume word problems, which constitutes 1.55% of the test. And in this one, the strategy is nowhere to find the volume formulas. That's it, not just volume formulas, area formulas. You gotta know what's on this test and what's available to you so you don't stress yourself out and trying to memorize things that you don't need to memorize, but you know exactly where to go when you need one of these formulas. So if you check this out right here, uh, this is a cylinder problem. It says the dairy farmer uses a storage silo that is in the shape of a right circular cylinder. If the volume is 72 pi, what is the diameter? Okay, once I know that, and by the way, this is in the front section of both the, the no calculator and calculator section of the test. Once I know where to go and where to flip back to, hey, check it out. There's my volume formula for a cylinder. Volume equals pi r squared h, where r is the radius. Now we just plug and chug, right? We've got, we know the volume is 72 pi. The equals pi times the radius, which is unknown. I'll keep it as r squared. And we know the height is eight. Now I'm going to eliminate the pies. I'm going to divide both sides by eight and we get nine equals r squared. Now to get r, I take the square root, square root, and r equals positive three. That is the radius, but they want the diameter. So we double it and we get a diameter of six and that is it. Next on the list is right triangle trigonometry, which also makes up 1.55% of the test. And here the tip is remember this rule, sine of x equals cosine of 90 minus x. What is that saying? That is saying that sine of an angle equals cosine of the complement of that angle. So for example, uh, sine of 30 equals cosine of 60. Sine of 10 equals cosine of 80. They always ask about this on the test. Almost every test, maybe one little question will be thrown in there, but, but it's really useful. So when they say that in a right triangle, one angle measures x, sine of x equals 4 fifths, cosine of 90 minus x, cosine of the complement, what does that equal? Equals the exact same thing and you're done. Next, we have circle theorems, which again makes up 1.55% of the test. And here, the strategy is to draw triangles in these circles. So what am I talking about? Let's take a look. It says in the XY plane above the circle of center, HK and the radius is 10. What is the value of K? What is the Y value of that center? Okay. This is a really hard problem if you just sit there and think about it. But if you start to draw in, of course, draw in these radii, look what happens you get these kind of interesting triangles that form. But not only that, that's, that's like an okay triangle, but really if we can draw another line and make a nice right triangle, something really interesting happens. Um, we've got this great right angle here, and this is gonna help us find this length. This is what we really need. We need this length right here because 
that is exactly going to correspond to k because it's that much above the x-axis. So what are all these values? Well, I know this is the radius right here, so this has a value of 10 and that's great. What is the length of this? Well, this we can figure out from the coordinates because knowing some rules and look, you don't have to have these memorized, but if you have a rough idea of when you draw that right, this line down that it bisects the chord, you're in good shape. That is a theorem, but you don't have to know it for sure. You just have to say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that seems logical and I'm going to use that information to my benefit. So if this goes from four to 20, this whole chord is a length of 16. Therefore, I'm gonna assume that this side here is only eight, right? And then now you see something special. We got a right triangle, we can use Pythagorean's theorem, and that's great. Or you can recognize that it's a Pythagorean triple. An eight, 10 is a six, eight, 10, really a three, four, five, but doubled, which means that this length is six, Therefore, my value of K is, of course, six as well. Next, we come to complex numbers, which constitutes 1.38% of the test. And here the strategy is know your conjugates. So in general, I think everybody taking the SAT knows that I is the square root of negative one, knows that I squared equals negative one, and that's great. But sometimes they give you these problems where we've got a denominator that we need to, uh, we need to make it real. We can't have imaginary numbers in the denominator. That's a general rule that the SAT always follows. So you look at this and you might be confused. How do I get the eyes out of there? You know, what's equivalent? Well, all you got to do is remember your conjugates. Conjugates are the same exact expression, but you exchange a minus for a plus or vice versa. So in this case, I'm going to multiply by my conjugates, okay? And this is how we make the denominator real. So I'm going to foil the, let's do the top first. So eight times three becomes 24 right and then we do 8 times 2i becomes 16i we do negative i times 3 becomes let's do a little thing here negative 3i and then we do negative i times 2i is minus 2i squared what happens on the bottom as we foil this this is a difference of squares right so it becomes 3 times 3 is 9 then we do 3 times 2i is 6i then we do negative 2i times 3 is negative 6i and then negative 2i times 2i is minus 4i squared. Now notice what happens here, goodbye i's. Then we have an i squared, that's okay because i squared is negative one. So it's like negative one times negative four is positive four. So we get nine plus four on the bottom. On the top we get, and again, I'm gonna turn, the, turn that i squared into a negative one times negative two is positive two. Okay, so I got 24 plus two is 26. And then 69 minus 13i is 13i. 69 minus 3i, excuse me. Then we bring these together and I got 26 plus 13i over 13. Divide these both by 13, right? And they get two plus i. And what do they want? They want the value of a in the expression a plus bi, which I have now, right? a plus bi and my b value is one, but they want the a value, which is two and we're done. Next, we have radicals and rational exponents, which makes up 1.21% of this test. And here, the strategy is numerator is power, denominator is root. Many times on this test, you're gonna have to convert back and forth between the rational exponent and the radical format, and that's all we're doing here. So if we remember that this is the power and this is the root, this becomes pretty straightforward, right? We simply take that nine, and we say nine to the third power to the fourth root, and that's it. But unfortunately, that answer does not show up here. And you can see it's question 12 on the no calculator section, which means it's gonna be a little bit on the harder side. So I see these ones here, and this is the correct form with a nine. So since that's not there, I'm gonna eliminate these guys. Now, let's look at the one with the threes and say, well, how can I turn that nine into a three? Well, I can do it as follows. Nine is really three squared, right? So then we've got it like this, and then three squared to the third power is three to the sixth. Let's see if I got some room over here. So we got three to the sixth, fourth root. And now this is interesting because three to the sixth to the fourth is the same as three to the six fourths, which I can reduce that just like any fraction and say three to the three halves. Now let's put it back into the, ra into the radical format. So it's three to the third power and the square root of that. Okay, now we're almost there. Very hard problem, right? Now we're almost there and that's really three times three times three. Well, isn't there a perfect square in there? Yes, three squared. 
So here, let me kind of move this over here. It's a little, getting a little cluttered, but this happens sometimes. So it's really three squared times three, that's three cubed. And the square root of three squared is just three, and we're left with three radical three, which is D. Next, we come to polynomial factors and graphs, and that makes up 1.03% of the test. And here the strategy is know how to identify roots. And when I say identify roots, I mean not just in a graph, I mean in an equation as well. So first of all, it says which of the following could be the, the equation of the graph above? And this is all about the roots. Where are the roots on the graph? They occur at negative 3, 0, and 2. Okay, so now I know I'm gonna see these numbers in the equation somewhere, but we gotta recognize that they're going to be flipped, meaning the signs are gonna be opposite. So when I see a root of negative three, I should see a positive three like I do right here. When I see a positive two, I should see a negative two like I do right here. And when I see, now, now for the, the zero root, I should just see an X because we know that this is a, a, a point where the function value is zero. So if I plug zero in for that X, it's gonna zero everything out. So A actually looks pretty good. There's one little problem with A that we also have to take into consideration and that's multiplicity. Now see how this, this goes from high to low. It pierces the X axis. That means a multiplicity of one. Here is also a multiplicity of one as it goes right through. But here it bounces, it deflects, which means it's a multiplicity of two, or it's an even multiplicity, but probably a multiplicity of two, which means my x term, which is just gonna be x by itself, cannot just be an x, it's gotta be an x squared. So A almost cuts it, except for it doesn't have the x squared. B looks like our winner. We're just gonna dismiss C because again, it doesn't have the x squared, and these are flipped. And again, this would mean a zero at negative two and positive three, not negative three and positive two like we have here. So B is the winner and we're done. Next, we have nonlinear equation graphs, which makes up 1.03% of the test. And here, the strategy is know the constants of quadratics. In this case, we're talking about vertex form. So this is very important in vertex form. What do all these constants indicate? All right, so I just want you to recognize that this term right here, really it's, a, it's, it's about a stretch, but in terms of positive or negative, it indicates whether it goes up or goes down. When it's negative, it opens down. If it's positive, it opens up. Uh, and then in the way it's written here, this B value is going to be the, the X value of the vertex. That C value is going to be the Y value of the vertex. And notice how this is opposite, right? It's minus here, but it's positive here. Okay, now we have that. It says the vertex of the parabola in the XY plane above is zero C, that makes sense, right? And it's opening up, which means up here, A is a positive value. What do the following state is true about the parabola with equation negative A, and then now we got this vertex at B comma C. All right, so the vertex is B comma C, I agree with that, but it says it opens upward. Well, I would agree with that except for A here is positive and here it's clearly negative, which means that this parabola is gonna open downwards. So these are both out, the upwards. And it says the vertex is BC and it opens downward. That's exactly what we predicted, I will go with that. The problem here is they say the vertex is negative B positive C. It's not that the X value is always opposite what you see in the equation in vertex form. Next we have angles, arc length, and trig functions, which makes up 1.03% of the test. And here the strategy is know the formulas for arc length and sector area. I have an entire video on the formulas you need to know for the SAT, uh, for the math portions. Definitely watch that again. Both of these formulas are on there and you should know them. Now, this question has to do with arc length. It says in a circle with center O, central angle AOB has a measure of five pi fourths radians. The area of the sector formed by central angle AOB is what fraction of the area of the circle? So area equals the, air, the central angle over, in this case it's radians, it, otherwise it'd be 360, but here I'll say two pi, because that is equivalent to 360 going all the way in around, around a circle, times pi r squared, okay? Guess what? Pi r squared is actually the area of the entire circle, so watch what's gonna happen here. If I now divide both sides by pi r squared, okay, they're saying the area of the sector formed by the central angle, which is my A value, is what fraction of the area of the circle? It's this, is, it, that's literally what I have, the area of the sector over the area of the circle, and it equals the central angle over two pi. Now we have our answer. But if you wanna take a shortcut, we know that the area of the sector is always the fraction of the central angle over two pi or, or 360. So now we've got our work nicely done for us, and we can just say the answer is five pi over four, over two pi, I'll even put that over one just for fun. 
then multiply up, multiply up. That's how I do it. Uh, then we got five pi over eight pi. The pi's cancel out and five over eight is our answer. Next we have circle equations, which makes up 1.03% of the test. And here the strategy is know the formula for a circle on the coordinate plane. If you haven't memorized it yet, I've got a great music video on this topic. If you just listen to the chorus a few times, you'll have it down. And here is the formula that you gotta know. It's X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equals the radius squared, where the center is H comma K. Okay. It says a circle in the xy plane as equation of this, which of the following points does not lie in the interior of the circle. Now, if we know all these different things about, hey, like my center is clearly going to be negative three comma one, and my radius is five, well, I can even make a little makeshift graph, you know, and we can, we can plot out this circle and then quickly eyeball and see which of these values are gonna make the cut and which are not. And the thing is, you can always then still use the distance formula if you want and not draw it out, but why not, right? We got one, two, three, and we go up one. So here's my vertex. And then we're going out five, let's say, in each direction, right? So that's five. We're going up five. We're going out five and down five. And here is roughly the circle. You know, I'm gonna do my best to kind of draw it out like this. Okay. So now let's just kind of, let's kind of eyeball, right? So if I know that this is, you know, we can look at these points. Already this zero, zero looks like it's definitely in the circle. The negative three, one is definitely in the circle because that's the, the center. And then we got this three, two value. It's looking to me like three, two is gonna be a problem. I was actually leaning towards A, but look, three, two is gonna be a problem because the farthest we go is two on the x-axis. So three, two would be up here. Uh, the negative seven, actually negative seven, three might be okay because if I'm already here at negative three, I'm gonna go out five this way. This is negative eight, that's beyond that. And then we go up three. I'm assuming this is on the exterior of the line, uh, at, right, right on the edge of the circle. So we could actually, I mean, we could plug this in, say negative seven, let's see. Four squared is 16 plus four. Oh, actually, I think it is on the interior. It's nicely within, within that interior. So anyways, this is good. This guy is out. And then if you want to verify, you can do the distance formula with this point and that point and see if it's more than five, it's out, right? So the distance formula is the difference of the X's, which in this case is six squared, right? Plus the difference of the Y's, two minus one, which is one squared. We take the square root of that. This becomes 36 plus one is square root of 37. That's more than six, which is more than five which means our answer is definitely D and we are done. Next on the list is data inferences, which constitutes only 0.52% of the test. And here the strategy is pay attention to the sample. So let's read this question. It says a study was done on the weights of different types of fish in a pond. A random sample, that sounds good, of fish were caught and marked in order to ensure that none were weighed more than once. The sample contained 150 largemouth bass. Now notice right there, that's our sample. It's largemouth bass, that's it. Of which 30% weighed more than two pounds. Which of the following conclusions can be made? The majority of all fish in the pond weigh less than two pounds. That makes no sense. First of all, we're only talking about largemouth bass. We don't know, there probably is more fish than largemouth bass. This is just largemouth bass that were caught. The average weight of all fish in the pond is two pounds. It doesn't say anything close to that, right? It's saying 30% weighed more than two pounds has nothing to do with the average weight. Approximately 30%, okay, at least we see 30% now, of all fish in the pond weigh more than two pounds. That's a problem because they say all fish. Our sample is largemouth bass. Uh, it's gotta be D, but it says approximately 30% of all largemouth bass in the pond weigh more than two pounds. That targets the sample that makes sense logically. So D is our answer and we're done. Last but not least, we come to the category of right triangle word problems, which makes up a small 0.17%. But this strategy applies to a lot of other components and general ideas going forward for triangle problems, which is to memorize Sokotoa. Sokotoa helps you so much on this test it, whenever trigonometry comes up. So I definitely recommend uh, memorizing it and it stands for sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse and tangent equals opposite over adjacent. So this is in the figure above, triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEF. That means that sine, cosine and tangent of B will equal sine, cosine and tangent of E. 
A, same with A, same, and, and D, same with C and F. Those are the corresponding angles. So it says in the figure, triangle ABC is similar. What is the value of cosine of E? Well, I don't have any values for this triangle, but I know cosine of E is the same as cosine of B. What is cosine of B? Again, it's adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent, which is next to it, over hypotenuse, which is the big dog. So it's 12 over 13, which is B, and we are done. That is it for the final 14 strategies on how to get a perfect 800 on your SAT math. Thank you guys so much for checking this video out. And if you haven't seen the first two parts, definitely watch those. Those are super important. And I wish you the best of luck in your SAT math journey. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the next video. Take it easy.